So, so the, the first thing is, uh, and I think you're absolutely right, we have no sense of how much energy has helped us escape poverty. Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, um, Matt Ridley uh, wrote in his sort of Rational Optimist, uh, why was it fun to be Louis XIV? And I'm not quite sure whether it was fun, but I can certainly see if, if I were back then, I'd probably want to be him rather than anyone else. And, and one of the points, of course, was that he had lots and lots of servants doing everything for him. You know, you had a, a whole bunch of people uh, uh, cooking his meals and cleaning his palaces and you know, doing his gardens and all that stuff. The point of that is it's really fun if you're a Louis XIV, but it really sucks if you're any of the other guys who have to be the servant of Louis XIV. What energy has enabled us to do is to make a society where we can all be the kings and the machines are the servants. So, you know, if you put it in power, uh, the average uh, OCD person in the OCD, is so in the rich world, has power that is equivalent to about 100 slaves or 100 servants. We have the power of 100 human beings 24-7. That's what takes us on rides. That's what washes our dishes, or you know, if you have a Roomba or whatever that uh, cleans up your house and do all these other amazing things. Uh, you know, clean your uh, your clothes. Uh, we have no sense of how much time, especially women used around the turn of last century, so around 1900. Uh, it was it was more than a day and probably two days just spent washing. Now we do it with a machine. We do it with lots of power. So we have to realize that the reason why the world has become so great is because we have an enormous, an abundance of power. And that enables us to all be kings rather than you know, the one being a king and everybody else being servants. But of course, the problem is that that also leads to other issues like air pollution and global warming. And I think it's important to recognize both of these because we often jump to global warming and say, oh, see, this is a terrible issue. But what was a much more terrible issue coming from the Industrial Revolution was air pollution. Air pollution probably uh, 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 had an impact, possibly killing 20% of everyone that died in London around uh, 1890. It was a terribly polluted place. Everybody wrote about it. You know, huge on, on uh, industrial revolution, but also huge on air pollution. And we still see that in the, uh, what was in 1953, I think, when, when they had the big uh, 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 soups and you know, uh, Churchill was faced with the fact that uh, there was this crisis where, what, 6,000 people died in, in, uh, in, uh, in London in just a few weeks because of terrible coal air pollution. But we fixed that. How do we fix that? Through technology. So the simple answer is not to say, let's do without the power. It was to make better power. Now we did that partly through scrubbers on our smokestacks. We also did that by switching from coal to gas. We eventually also switched, uh, or at least some nations did, to nuclear, which pollutes even less. The idea here is to recognize that while there were problems, anyone in a heartbeat would have said, I'd rather have the Industrial Revolution and cough than just being dirt poor. But the best outcome, of course, is have the Industrial Revolution cough, be smart, figure out a solution, and then just be rich. And that was what we did. We're now standing at the same sort of issue where we're realizing there is another pollutant that comes out of burning fossil fuels, not just the thick smoke that was obvious, but also carbon dioxide, CO2, which leads to a warm up of the planet. That's absolutely incontrovertible. So let's just get that on the, on, on the table. But the question is, how big of a problem is it? And what can we do about it? And that's where I think the, the, the conversation that we have right now has sort of gone off the tracks. Uh, you know, People will tell you, this is the end of the world. If you read the UN climate panel reports, it is not. The UN tells us this is a problem. It's by no means the end of the world. A problem that we then have to weigh up against the cost of actually doing something about it. And the answer, like pretty much anything that we do in human society is you do some of it, you fix some of it until the damage costs are lower than the additional cost if you try to fix more of it.